understand how important it is to preserve our history uh, and release it to the world. Um, and so I wrote a poem after Robert Hayden's Middle Passage uh, from the perspective of one of the slaves who led a revolution on the ship by the name of Cinquez. Uh, and so the name of the poem is called Cinquez. I sank into your skins the night you died. Those pungent skins, those pungent skins killed men. Those pungent skins killed men who were more like winged birds. Those pungent winged birds, men who could not fly, died protecting a door. A portal of shifting images cast over Fata Morgana and her faithful ships that to the human eye resembled a bending of light and ghostly mirages of men wading above troubled water. We, however, were all but human, subhuman, and subhuman eyes witnessed blades of ghastly glass and a sea of grass sifted like heat on wheat and the wheat burned and the sea of glass and grass became a withered repository of subhuman wheat stalks, charred and etched on a charted glass path, and there was singing and groaning and the new pay of pungent skin on stolen soil as if the voyage of death into life wasn't, wasn't enough. I cried to the lightning to allow me to share a sliver of your death to see if he really was as white as you claimed. And it said to me, to whom does a sliver of death owe a shared experience when it created life in the blood water slit of a bronze thigh? Uh, and if you know anything about the Middle Passage, there was a door, symbolic door, uh, called the Door of No Return, where slaves were expected to not return back home. Uh, and so this poem is uh, an ode, maybe a dark ode with uh, bits of light in it, uh, written in the form of a sestina, which is an Italian po uh, poetic form, uh, which has six lines in every stanza. And there are repeated words uh, that I'm sure you'll catch on to as the poem progresses. This is Door of Return. Beyond the threshold of this door, whispers the sea, and this slave house answers through the carvings imprinted in the stone foundation where the crashing sea foam reaches its peak. Last night, I came to acknowledge that we may die as slaves and like our ancestors, will join the ranks of our ancestral spirit. Tonight, 
I raise my chains in farewell and cast my eyes on the Atlantic waters. We death march to the demon ship. I pray that God troubles the waters and takes us to paradise before we are crushed by the blackened sea. Every step away from the slave house takes another sliver of spirit from me. Just as the ocean's ebb and flow strips away concrete into a carving that can only be understood by the sons and daughters of slaves. And on that day of understanding, our generations will stand on liberation's peak. But for now, all we can do is remain silent and peak through the cracks between jams caused by frigid waters, reminding ourselves that our children will not be slaves. They will be masters of the land, air, and sea. They will be skillful architects and sculptors who carve out the hearts of stone and usher in a new spirit. And I look at my son in chains next to his mother, and he hasn't lost his spirit. But I, I am on the brink of losing my sanity. I'm peaked by the slave master's bloody and merciless carvings on my brother's back and legs, and the only healer is holy water. I pray that the God of my mother and father engulfs us beneath the abyss of sea to end this cursed life of pain and sacrifice as the devil slaves. For maybe it is better to be drowned as a saint than to be sold into slavery, because they'll beat, whip, and rape us until there is only a faint wisp of spirit. Beat, whip, and bag us first before throwing us back to sea. Beat, whip, and curse us for seeking God on the mountain's peak. Beat, whip, and kill us, but it will not stop us from reaching the water. Our return is cemented on the stone and to carve where the ocean meets the carving, and at our land's edge there is a divine carving that tells a story about 12 million slaves, slaves whose skin and strength are forged by water, slaves whose prayers are delivered by the Spirit, and slaves whose visions and dreams are cast at the peak of moonrise over a somber sea. There is a sunrise at the edge of sea, carving mountain peaks over the eastern coast of a new land, where we find that a spirit is ready to lead us to new territory, away from the water. Thank you. Earlier I mentioned that a lot of my work now is diving into, very much diving into uh, the water the ocean and uh, restoring things that uh, are submerged underneath uh, things that nobody really wants to talk about. Um, and so I haven't talked about this to a lot of people, uh, but I am introducing a new mythical character uh, into uh, the diasporic lens uh, to help people understand uh, our history more. And so I've given this character a name. Uh, he has an official name, but I'm going to give you the nickname. And his nickname is Omi, O-M-I, which is Yoruba for water. And this poem is called Omi. I am at the ripe old age when I sit near the water, breathe salt air through my nostrils, and stroke the wild of my beard. The ocean snores my favorite song. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. I sweep wind behind and beneath me to hear the frail voice rushing toward me a second time. Swift gurgling of fresh water over jagged stones. O oh, son, where is thy son? And why does the moon stare without a care into a night chock full of stars and stripes? The brown cow eats in its stable, away from the white cows who feed on tender grass near William's red wheelbarrow. Thank you. There's a certain beauty uh, in imagining where our people go when people decide to take their lives. Uh, by people, I mean black people who were killed uh, wrongfully by police. Uh, and so I wrote a poem uh, for Dante Wright's sister uh, about a year and some change ago. Uh, and this poem is called Views from Eternity uh, and it has been published uh, but I think this poem gives a very beautiful description of 
uh, where he may be. The day I took my rest, God's angels whisked my soul away before I could feel the pain. I opened my eyes to a fiery chariot ablaze in golden flames. On the side of the chariot was written an inscription, Instruments for the Living. Return to the mountains not and they'll never forget you. Then I heard thunder but saw no rain, lightning but no darkness. I heard a shout but felt no anger. And then there was silence. There was peace. I peered over the blazing chariot to witness the sun opening before my eyes. Inside, a crystalline mountain stood before me, and atop the mountain stood Floyd and Taylor, Martin and Garner, Aubrey and Brown, King and Lewis. They reached out to pull me up to my hollow place on the mountain, and they all rejoiced in one voice, saying, They'll never forget you now, and neither will we. So when my son rests, God sends me to him on a fiery chariot of rays and golden flames. I cradle him in the spirit until I can embrace him at the edge of eternity. Those of us who make it to the mountaintops where there is peace and rest witness the gift of immortality. We never die. We are alive. I.